Good afternoon, and welcome to today's program about retention and those who leave treatment against clinical advice. Our program title is Lower ACA Rates Equal Better Outcomes, Improving Treatment Retention at Your Facility. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is a Foundation's Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Millennium Health. Thank you to our sponsor and to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, let me share a few housekeeping details with you. You'll notice that each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging, or it can be enlarged and minimized by clicking the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. If you cannot see this area, simply click the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's presentation, please click the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. If you have any technical issues during the program, please click the yellow help button and we will definitely help you troubleshoot the issue. And a special note about CE credit. To receive credit for today's program, you must click the green CE certificate at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. If you're watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and evaluation form located in today's resources list and follow the instructions. If you have any trouble with this process, please do not reach out today to today's sponsor as they will not be able to assist you in receiving a certificate. Please note, CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event today. And finally, you can also tweet during today's webinar via Twitter by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the hashtag APLiveWebinar. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Siobhan Morris. Siobhan is the Director of Research and Fidelity for Foundations Recovery Network. She holds a master's degree in Health Services Administration from Florida International University. Also, Siobhan earned her, certif her certification as a clinical research coordinator from the Associates of Clinical Pharmacology and conducted over 100 clinical trials with major pharmaceutical companies investigating new and promising treatments. She holds her certifications as an ARISE interventionist and as a master addiction counselor. Siobhan's work has been published in research journals, including indexed in PubMed citations. Thank you so much, for Siobhan, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, I will turn the audience over to you. Great. Hi. Thank you, Julie. And um, thank you, Addiction Professional and Millennium Labs for sponsoring this. I'm very excited to share this data that we've generated here at Foundation's Recovery Network. So um, let's start with some background. Um, here we go. Great. So, Co-occurring substance use disorder and mental illness are big problems in the U.S. Um, approximately 27.6 of adults who used illicit drugs in the past year also had a mental illness. Only about 13% of adults who did not use, um, who did not have a mental illness, used illicit drugs. So you've got about double the incidence when it comes to um, the mental mental health illness. Alcohol use in the past month was also higher among adults with mental illness, and um, again, 37.8 of the 20 million adults with SUD had a co-occurring mental illness. That's um, data that came from SAMHSA, and this next slide sort of illustrates the co-occurring nature of these disorders. 43.8 million adults had a mental illness um, in the prior year, and this is from the 2013 SAMHSA um, NSDUH survey and 7.7 .7 million Americans had both mental illness as well as substance use disorders. So you can see that um, the nature of dual diagnosis treatment is extremely important. So who's actually getting treatment? So of those 7.7 .7 million adults with co-occurring mental illness and substance use disorder, over half of them are not receiving any treatment whatsoever. And as you look at this slide, what you can see is only about 7, 8% are actually receiving dual diagnosis treatment. 
So definitely something needs to be done about this um, in terms of increasing the number of people who are able to receive services and then being able to keep them in treatment when they do come to us for, for services. So of those who receive treatment, dropping, um, treatment dropouts are a big issue. It's still, although we know that um, it's so important to remain in treatment, um, it still seems to be a problem and we still have difficulty holding on to patients. Um, and most studies indicate that the greatest risk of leaving treatment is in the first few weeks of treatment. So um, basically what the literature says is that length of stay is a very strong predictor of outcome, which most of us in the industry, you know, we already know that. And um, there's some really interesting studies by Moose and Moose that, that talk about it's not even so much the intensity of the service. It's more about how long you actually stay in, engaged in the therapeutic process. So someone who gets very intense treatment services, for example, for two weeks, um, is less likely to have positive or long-term positive outcomes as someone who gets less intensive services over, say, a 90-day period. Um, and then again, treatment retention is often used in the literature as a, as a predictor or as, even as a proxy for relapse, um, um, for recidivism to crime, and as well as for um, the ability to sustain recovery. So lots of the, li the literature has investigated a number of different um, factors that seem to impact um, the ability to keep people in treatment. Um, for example, they've looked at different types of program factors. So what in the, the treatment program or the, the treatment offering um, can impact whether or not a patient stays throughout a full course of treatment or remains engaged in the system? And then again, what in, in that person might influence whether they remain in treatment or they, um, they tend to, they leave early. So things that have been looked at include therapeutic alliance, you know, the ability to, to bond or um, develop an engagement or a, a positive, you know, therapeutic relationship with a therapist or other professional in treatment, um, the use of motivational interviewing techniques, different types of gender-specific programming, gender-specific interventions. Um, payer source has been looked at as, um, you know, whether it's private pay, insurance, or public funding. Um, and then the other things that have been included are, are for example, use of integrated treatment services um, for co-occurring, for example. Um, some of the personal and substance use things that have been looked at are age, gender, primary drug of, drug of choice, level of motivation, different types of um, life stressors, especially in the gender literature, have been studied extensively. For example, you know, in women we know that there are a different set of life stressors that, um, that influence them and so therefore impact their treatment, their, their decision to commit to treatment or not, for example. And then self-efficacy, which is really um, an interesting predictor because it's sort of, self-efficacy is about um, if I believe that I can actually impact or affect change in my own life or if I can have a, a positive influence in my own life. And so to, to study, you know, um, that in terms of if it keeps people in treatment is, is an interesting angle. So therapeutic alliance, a positive therapeutic alliance was strongly associated with staying in treatment, with coming back for more treatment or, you know, the attendance at group. And, um, and it does appear to impact outcomes somewhat. Um, however, there's not like a definite or definitive um, relationship there. Motivational in interviewing, which um, is a, a widely used technique across treatment centers and in practices, has had um, positive results. But, um, but it's actually not been shown to be all that different from using educational counseling, you know, psychoeducational and psychotherapeutic counseling. There have been a great deal of studies in terms of gender-specific programming um, to be a significant factor, especially when it's, it's targeted at women and dealing with the different issues. Um, for example, if you could think of uh, uh, the potential different trauma issues that women might have from men or just the personal nature of trauma and its impact on um, the ability to recover and on the outcomes of treatment, um, separating out men and women would then seem to have a, a great effect. Payment source again, as well as um, using integrated and co-occurring treatment methods. 
Um, so what's interesting is there's really been nothing definitive in terms of um, the, the personal characteristics and um, substance use. For example, which substance you use or um, what age you are. There's, there's a whole, it, it's, it's very unpredictable, although age is the most likely to predict. With um, older age tends to be associated with a longer length of stay, which really longer retention, greater commitment. And that, um, that in turn may have to do with some of the motivational factors associated with um, being a little older and wiser. So again, primary drug of choice, you know, it's been looked at in, in a number of different settings. Um, and so they've, they've done different types of analyses. And alcohol, in this study by Deanne and, and, co and colleagues, alcohol use was associated with longer retention when compared to other types of drug use. Um, the DATOS study looked at um, different levels of psychological severity, and back in the 90s, you know, cocaine use was so rampant, and that was actually associated with not remaining in treatment. Today, analogous to that would probably be um, amphetamine um, use. Um, and then motivation for treatment, of course, very strong and robust predictor of retention. So at Foundations, we have a research department. And um, our research department, which I have the, the honor of, of heading up, is our mission is to develop and communicate reli reliable, valid, and timely information to support decision making by consumers, clinicians, organizational leadership, and policymakers. And so to that end, what um, we do is, is we conduct what would be called retrospective, naturally occurring, quasi-experimental design research. Um, what that looks like is just we go back to the data and look at groups that naturally occur, for example, by age, by substance use, and we look at differences um, in both how they, they come into treatment um, and what happens after treatment as a result. Um, the research setting is a private, for-profit, absent-based, individualized dual diagnosis treatment center, which is fairly different from what is available in most of the literature. Um, and what's actually not even written here is that it's also residential. So a great deal of the substance um, use disorder research comes from publicly funded, um, primarily outpatient settings. So we believe this is a significant contribution in that it's looking at a population that has not been terribly, you know, very well studied. So all patients that come to you know, treatment at a foundation's residential facility are offered the opportunity to participate in a research project. Um, what that looks like is they, they receive a consent to treatment at intake, and they also are asked to sign a consent to participate in research. The research project is basically a follow-up project. We get permission to, in those who consent, which is better. Last year's um, consent rate at residential was 92% of the patients who entered treatment consented to participate, and so that means that we can look at their intake data, their chart data, um, their financial, you know, um, billing data, as well as they give us information so that we can follow up at one month after discharge, six months after discharge, and 12 months after discharge. For the purposes of this study, we're really just looking at the intake data and at the chart data. So um, we collect as part of the intake, um, specifically for the research intake, um, the Addiction Severity Index and the Eureka or University of Rhode Island Change Assessment. Um, and we also, for this study, looked at information regarding diagnosis and length of stay from their patient charts. So the Addiction Severity Index, which many of us know as the ASI, has been around since the mid-1980s. And um, it's a, a standard, very psychometrically proven instrument that measures problem severity in seven areas alcohol and drug use, medical health, employment, or self-support, financial sort of, um, legal activities, psychiatric health, and then family or relationship um, areas. Um, and what we use currently is the ASI, it's called the ASI Light, and we use the composite score um, version. So that means that we're able to calculate composite scores for each of those areas which reflect that problem severity for that person's life. A higher score is um, a higher severity. 
So the Eureka, or the University of Rhode Island Change Assessment, um, is a measure of readiness to change. And what it does is it approximates those, for, um, those stages of change described by De Clemente, Prochaska, and Norcross that, um, that are so widely used throughout the, the, um, the industry. And it, it breaks them down into just to four. You're either pre-contemplative, contemplative, you're in action, or you're in maintenance. Um, so the pre-contemplative stage really has to do, that's, that's probably where we see most patients who enter substance use disorder treatment. They come in and they're thinking about, maybe thinking about um, getting some kind of treatment. In many cases, this is where the denial lives, and um, they're still not um, actually quite ready to admit that they, there is a problem. Um, a big part of what treatment is able to accomplish often is moving people from pre-contemplative to contemplative and in best case scenarios, allowing them to be in action when they leave. But this indicator of readiness to change is really an indicator of um, motivation for treatment. And as we saw in the literature review, very strongly associated with um, whether or not they're going to remain in treatment. So um, I really, what we wanted to be able to do at Foundation was to begin to define um, who are the types of people who in this setting, in a private residential setting, um, treating primarily dual diagnosis patients, who remains in treatment? Who, um, who are, there, are there any characteristics that we can sort of point to that say, well, this is a, a group that, that we know is going to stay, or this is a group that we know is going to struggle. We focused on those first four weeks of treatment because the literature indicates that you know retention losses are highest during that period. Um, the way we approached this is we looked at all the characteristics that we had as a result of their demographic information, the, um, the use of those surveys, and then some diagnostic information, and we compared those um, using descriptive statistics at first, then by varied analysis, which was primarily t-tests, and then we used some um, different types of regression, both logistic and Cox regressions, to try to come up with some predictors in different groups. So I guess I'd like to ask, um, as we're getting ready to get into the data, if, is um, have you in your practice or your treatment center, have you noticed that there are certain groups of patients or characteristics that are common to patients that seem to be related to staying in treatment or leaving treatment early? Like are there groups that you could perhaps point to that say, oh, yeah, this is a group um, that is most likely to stay? Or, or for example, I know that people, um, you might think to yourself, I know people who are a little bit older who are alcohol users are going to stay and I have, you know, maybe you have difficulty with um, keeping, retaining op young opiate users or anything like that, some sort of characteristics that fall that way. Okay, so maybe you do and maybe you haven't noticed that. So we did notice things like that, and we saw that in our, in our um, ACA rates, in our, our populations that were leaving um, against clinical advice, and that's really how we began um, to look at this data. So who, who was in this study? There's 1,317 patients who voluntarily sought treatment at one of our treatment centers. The average study age was 36 years old. Um, and what I included here are the ages, the, the information on those who chose not to participate in research, so in that 10 to 12 percent who did not participate in research. And um, what we found is there's no major differences between those who participate in research and in this project and those who didn't. Um, 60 per, 61 percent of the study population was male, and the average length of stay for the study population was actually 32 days versus 30 days for those who did not participate in the study. So what we found in the initial, um, in the initial study was that gender was associated with 30-day retention, and women are much more likely than men to remain in treatment. Um, 
we also found that older people were less likely to remain in treatment, which is actually the exact opposite of what we were looking um, at when we looked at the literature, um, which, again, is not necessarily surprising because remember most of the literature is focused on a um, different type of a population as well as um, perhaps different settings looking most largely at um, outpatient settings and we were looking at residential. So we also um, found that patients with higher medical employment and psychiatric scores were more likely to stay in treatment which was, was good news so that these issues could be addressed. Um, Individuals with opiate abuse or dependency were about half as likely as individuals when compared to individuals with other substance use disorders to still be in treatment at 30 days. So they were a little bit more likely to leave early. And um, as could be expected, as readiness for change composite score increased as they moved along that scale from pre-contemplative to contemplative to action to maintenance, they were more likely to remain in treatment. So we then looked at um, we then went and looked at, at the differences in gender. So the first study just looked at the population overall, and then we came back and said, well, since we saw that gender can make a difference, um, how does that actually show up? How are men and women different in terms of their decision to remain in treatment? And um, and in in terms of the literature in the background, they have found significant differences with both the rate of entry into treatment as well as the decision to remain in treatment. And issues traditionally associated with gender, such as child care employment and trauma, tend to be um, related to variations found in retention. So the demographics for um, study two, basically there were significant differences um, were found in all categories between men and women. Women tended to be older, they stayed in treatment a little bit longer, they were more likely to be in treatment at 30 days and were less likely to be African American or employed. So whereas traditionally the literature um, is looking at um, perhaps different um, socioeconomic groups, um, and publicly funded treatment in an outpatient setting where women would necessarily need to be um, employed or um, um, primary breadwinners and have you know functions outside of the home in private residential treatment perhaps there's less of an issue when it comes to employment and so our population did differ from the traditional literature on that that point so um, Again, I just want to give you a moment to look at this chart and to notice the differences between both the men and the women and the total sample. So when it came to addiction severity and readiness to change, there were significant differences between men and women in all except alcohol and readiness. Um, women had more medical problems. They had greater severity in ASI employment score, they had greater severity in family and relationship issues as well as in psychiatric issues. They were more ready for change, however, um, and they had fewer drug and legal problems. So what that basically looks like is women came in um, more impaired physically or with more medical issues. Um, they were, although they, as we saw, were less likely to be employed, um, that and that actually might be sort of a, a causal relationship there. They they had more issues or more severity or concern around their employment and their financial support and how how that was going to be managed. Um, they were just slightly less likely, basically the same um, as in terms of having alcohol issues, but they were slightly less likely to have drug issues or legal issues they um, had a greater concern or more severity in terms of issues in terms of their family and the relationships, and um, they had greater psychiatric severity. But they were also more ready to change, which is a positive sign. So um, other differences were that males were more likely to be diagnosed with cocaine or cannabis use disorder, 
and females more were more likely to have a diagnosis of major depression, anxiety, mood disorder, or eating disorder. And that sort of corresponds with what we saw in the ASI, that um, males had higher drug severity, women had higher psych severity. So the results for males. Basically, um, what was interesting is the readiness for change was not as significantly associated with retention for men. So although women came in um, with, uh, with a greater um, readiness for change, it didn't seem to matter when it, it actually talked about um, the retention for men. It didn't seem to impact whether or not men stayed in treatment or not. So that just sort of looks like even um, males coming in with a high level of denial or who are still sort of on the edge of thinking about, thinking about, maybe I have a problem, um, you, with you know, proper treatment, I guess, with, with the use of MI, you know, they still have a very strong chance of remaining in treatment. So what did predict um, for men was age, um, whether or not they had an ADHD diagnosis, and then the ASI employment subscale composite score um, was very important for men. Um, so the more severe their subscale score in the employment was, which means basically the more issues and the more problem severity that they have around employment, which doesn't necessarily mean they are or aren't employed, but it has a lot to do with, with um, how, how severe they believe their issues are, like they might lose their job or they're very concerned about their job or about getting a job. That was a very strong predictor for men. Similar, the diagnosis of ADHD, um, resulted in being 41% more likely to stay in treatment. And then age, for each year increase in age, the likelihood, so as men got older, they actually were more likely to remain in treatment. So the results for females were just a little bit different. And again, in this um, it, at model, we used a, a Cox regression model. And um, what it suggested was that cocaine use, depression, uh, location and ASI subscale composite scores and readiness to change were significantly associated with, um, with remaining in treatment. So location is in there because interestingly enough we found that in women, which treatment center they went to in our, our, our array of treatment centers actually did make a difference as to how long they stayed. Um, and then women who were cocaine dependent were less likely to remain in treatment, which is interesting because it does actually uh, reflect the results that were seen in the public sector as well, um, the severity of drug use. So it was not predictive, right? And if we look back, we remember that women were less likely to have drug use, high drug use severity than men, but using alcohol, the, the greater severity of alcohol use was associated with remaining in treatment. And looking back at the difference between men and women, it's interesting because men and women came in with about the same level of severity of alcohol use disorder when, with, as far as the ASI scores go, but it was predictive in women, whereas it was not predictive in men. So being diagnosed with depression, they were more likely to remain in treatment, which kind of makes sense and is very fortunate. And um, women who scored in the earlier stages of readiness for change were less likely. So in women, um, being in that early pre-contemplative or contemplative area where you're still sort of either thinking about, thinking about, or where you're just really perhaps um, willing to uh, discuss the possibility of actually having a problem, those women were less likely to stay. Um, women who were further along the spectrum, of course, in action or maintenance were much more likely. And that's really what that instrument is designed to do. So it kind of it served its purpose in women, but it was unable to actually provide that predictive value in men, which was kind of interesting. So we have another poll question. and. So um, I wonder, have you seen an increase in the number of young adults entering treatment at your facility or practice? And we'll just um, let you answer that for a few seconds. What's interesting is that, um, and we'll get into some of this in the background coming up, um, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, a great deal of younger people have been provided access to care. And so we wondered if you've actually seen an increase in your facility or in your practice of those 18 to 25 year olds. 
And here's an opportunity for you to go ahead and answer that poll question. Okay, great. Let's see what you guys had to say. Okay, so about 82% of you have seen an increase. That's really interesting, um, and that just proves out everything that uh, that they've been. One of the th main things, anyway, that they've been trying to accomplish with uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I do have some actual statistics on how that's that's going overall. So age differences. So the next study that we did, since we found that two of the big predictors in that first study were age and gender, and there's such readily available um, ways to categorize, you know, in terms of, like I said, that quasi-experimental naturally occurring groups. So um, that's the next thing that we looked at. And so anyway, in terms of background, according to the White House estimates, three million young adults gained health insurance coverage as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and the, which is very good for this industry because 18 to 25 year olds have the highest rate of substance use from any other age group. Um, and the median age of onset for substance use related disorders is 20 years of age. Um, similarly, the uh, most mental health diagnoses um, are first discovered before the age of 24. So this is a, it's, it's just so imperative that we create access to this age group for substance use and mental health disorder treatment. So what we have is, um, is a study where now it's 959 of our patients um, were used in this study, and about 21% um, were young adults between 18 and 25. Uh, there was no significant difference in the gender um, composition between the two groups, and I do refer to the, uh, the 26 and older as older adults, but um, um, I don't consider them older or old in any way, <laughs> but older adults were more likely to be African American, and um, overall both groups were, um, however, most likely to be Caucasian. So young adults had a greater severity with employment issues drug and legal issues, whereas older adults tended to have greater severity with medical and alcohol. There were no significant differences in family or in, uh, in psych or in readiness to change. So if we look at the chart, um, what we can see is there's a, a huge difference in, in the medical issues in older adults that would be expected in the severity or the impact of those medical issues on their SUD. Um, Employment actually was a greater issue for young adults, um, those under 25, which is fairly interesting because one would think that that's more going to be um, an older adult issue. Um, alcohol, so older adults were more likely to have alcohol use disorders, whereas younger adults were more likely to have drug-related issues. Again, um, younger adults were more likely to have legal issues than the older adults. And um, for family, psychiatric, and readiness to change, there were really no significant differences between the two groups. So some of the other differences, um, which are a little bit surprising, but younger adults tended to stay in treatment almost four days longer than their older counterpoints. They stayed in, in treatment for nearly 36, well, a little over 35 days, whereas um, older adults stayed in treatment for about 32 days. Um, older adults, however, were more likely to be employed, which is understandable, and, and that could perhaps be part of what's driving the concern about employment for younger adults. Um, another piece of that could also be um, one of the things we brainstormed about that was the legal um, issues. So we know that so many employers now conduct really thorough background checks, and so once uh, once they've got legal involvement, I, there's tends to be a great deal of concern about the future and um, and some hopelessness surrounding the possibility of ever getting you know that career that maybe they had thought of. Um, younger adults were more likely to be diagnosed with cannabis, opiate, or multiple drug use disorder, but less likely to be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, which is fairly expected. Um, so when they, uh, so 
also keep in mind that multiple use disorder would include the use of alcohol as well. So younger people were more likely to be using more than one thing um, or to have, let's say, have issues or meet criteria for more than one substance. Um, and they had real similar distributions, however, of, a, of mental health disorder diagnoses. So the results showed that there's a greater severity in the employment subscale on the ASI. So basically, the greater the severity of um, employment issues, the less likely someone is going to remain in treatment, regardless of what age they were. So that's really significant because it, it does um, it speaks to um, issues that we need to to address. Um, overall, that's one of those things that, that we've seen in each of these different age groups and in the population um, combined. So if we can do at intake a thorough assessment of what's going on in their education, their employment, their financial life, um, we can have a better idea of how stressed basically they're going to be. You know, we've um, probably all seen those patients who come in and after about two weeks, they begin to feel a little bit better. Um, they've detoxed, perhaps, and now they're like, okay, I've got to go. I have issues I have to deal with. I, I have to leave. I have to go back to work, or I have to get a job, or I'm running out of money. And, um, and so really looking to, to intervene early, you know, to identify people that are, are scoring, well, in our case, that score high in the ASI employment subscale and intervening with them early. Um, in older adults, greater severity on the psych um, subscale predicted lower retention rates. So again, looking at a subscale score. So even if you don't use the ASI, that, what that can look like is overall saying, okay, so there's some serious psych severity here. Um, I know this is going to be an issue and I'm going to have to begin to intervene early. Again, looking at those um, in younger adults being in contemplative stage, for example, someone who comes in who is perhaps recognizing that they have a problem but has lost hope of being able to actually create a solution. That's going to be a group that you're going to want to look at, that you're going to want to intervene early with. You're going to want to perhaps have um, directed MI conversations with these early in treatment because these seem to pose a greater, you know, these factors pose a greater risk of leaving early. So what we did is we then looked at who left early. So that was all just looking at, at all three of those studies looked at our general populations and divided it and subdivided it and wanted to determine, like, what's associated with remaining 30 days or not remaining 30 days and with length of stay. And there was, um, if, if, you know, you look up the original articles, there's also some um, survival analyses that come with that that show where the drops are. And, and I can tell you for women, for example, the, the drop is the is about, I mean, excuse me, for men, the drop is at about 20 days. At about 20 days, men tend to leave the program, whereas women stay and their first big initial drop doesn't occur until about 28 days. And that has a lot to do with that employment piece, and I think it also has to do with, with you know, taking time away from work, for example. So then we said, okay, so let's, let's look at this from a completely different angle. Let's see who left, and let's see what they have in common. Um, the idea is to, to identify who's likely to leave by creating a profile based on just what, what they're coming in with, just what I have learned you know, at intake, right? Because if we know in the beginning who is possibly going to leave, what we can do is we can begin to intervene and avoid that conversation. You know, ideally, we want to prevent the please don't leave, you need to stay, you need more treatment conversation. We'd like to avoid that completely. Um, so it's preventing it rather than treating the possibility of ACA. So we looked at one, this is a um, database primarily on um, Michael's House Treatment Center and their ACA data from um, a one-year period. And what we did is we did a bivariate or a t-test analysis looking at the intake survey data 
and we found that there were several variables that were significant. We then included everything in the logistic regression to identify what um, was most likely to predict ACA. So as part of this analysis, what I need to say is there's no um, cumulative effect that um, in the the way we did the analyses, I can't, I can't claim that there's a cumulative effect. What I mean by that is that if they have three factors, they have one factor. I can't tell you that three factors is going to be three times as likely to leave. Um, we simply looked at it in a way to see is this factor related and at what level, and um, is this factor related and at what level. So what we what we found were, um, and this is again all of so that you you. What I want everyone on the call to get is that everything that we have talked about here um, is actually using intake clinical assessment data and then chart data on length of stay. So one of the things that this speaks to is the just absolute importance of doing a thorough intake assessment and really getting to know what's going on with your patients when they come to you. None of this is is, is actually outside the scope of a standard clinical practice. And what we've been able to do is identify categories, groups, and factors associated with remaining in treatment and leaving treatment early. So we found that there were um, significant variables um, that were more likely to leave ACA. So for example, in the ASI, some of the questions have to do with um, an individual's perceived level of need for treatment or um, perceived stress based on whatever that, that issue area is. So we looked, instead of at composite scores in this analysis, at sort of item by item, question by question in the questions on that ASI composite score light survey. And so people, for example, who indicated that they were not at all troubled or bothered by alcohol problems were 1.6 more likely to leave than those who were troubled at any level. And the, the way the question is phrased is, you know, um, are you, how troubled or bothered are you by your problems with alcohol? Not at all. Um, somewhat, very, you know, to extremely, right? Those who viewed um, treatment for alcohol as not important were two and a half times more likely to leave treatment than those who viewed it as important at all, right? Those who viewed treatment for family problems not important were 1.3 times more likely to leave than those who, who didn't think it was important. And the same thing, twice as likely when it comes to psych. So when I first saw this, what that said to me is, wow, these are completely intervenable. This is all, these are all things that have to do with my, the perceived importance to me or, or my perception of what's going on in my life. And immediately what I thought of is, is motivational interviewing and having those conversations. Um, these are factors that while they are in, innate in the, the patient, they're actually factors that are, are able to be addressed therapeutically. And so what we decided to do is to take all of the data that we had from the first you know, three studies as well as this data, and this is not um, – actually in use right now, it's sort of a sample of what could be done if you were to go back and look at your intake data and do this. And, and again, some of you are going to think, oh, this is the list. Well, this is a list. Um, what I'd like you to, to get is that this is what you could create using the intake data at your facility simply by looking at some very basic things. So the idea would be that you would um, conduct your intake interview, and then you'd go back and you'd look and you'd say, okay, are they male? And if you're doing, for example, the ASI like we are, if they're male and they scored high on that employment subscale, that would be one check mark, right? If they're female and they scored high on alcohol or cocaine, or they have a cocaine use disorder, that would be a check mark. If they're 26 and older and they're scoring high on a psych um, subscale, those are people that, that might have a, a greater risk. And then the, if they're not troubled or bothered at all by their alcohol use, if they don't think it's important to get treatment for their alcohol problems, um, if they reported no, that they, they don't think it's important to get treatment for their psych issues, if they've been intoxicated more than five days in the last 30, or if they've used opiates, hallucinogens, or amphetamines in the last 30. So 
ideally what we would do is um, we would then sort of check that off and determine the total number of check marks and we'd look to see, okay, so here we have someone who's at high risk. Um, my sort of like little dream scenario with this would be there would be sort of like an MI SWAT team <laughs> that could target during the, the detox phase and during the early phases of treatment be able to target individuals who have a high number of checks to be able to help them walk through some of these issues knowing that they're at greater risk. Um, what's really interesting just from a research standpoint is that it does matter their perceived um, level of need of treatment or their perceived you know, stressors or problems with their disorder, but in so many cases the readiness for change score was insignificant, which is sort of you know, their motivation for treatment. So it, those seem to correspond even though overall readiness for change did not seem to have a significant impact. So um, what I hope that you were able to get from this presentation is that just using basic intake data, you know, and doing, you don't need to do logistic regression or Cox regression, but really even just doing some counting, looking for some trends, doing some maybe some simple chi-square or t-tests, which any Excel program can help you, can help you run, you could begin to identify patients who are, are perhaps at a greater risk in your practice of not continuing treatment. Um, if, if you can do that, then you can actually focus on those factors. You can provide programming that would allow them to have um, their needs met. Um, for example, um, in response to use of opiates, we found that, that opiate um, pe people who come in having used, used opiates in the last 30 days were a little bit more difficult to keep in treatment. Well, two interesting things happened. So what we did was we decided that we would have a special opiate group once a week with just people who are opiate users. Um, because then people who had remained and sort of gotten through that two and three week period, which is really difficult, um, could help the others, pull the others through. And they, they'd have things in common and it'd be a, a specific little programming element. So that was very, we found that to be very helpful. And there was a side effect of that actually. Um, if you look, there's also, there's three factors associated with alcohol use um, in that checklist that I created. One of the side effects was when we pulled out the opiate people, we had primarily a group of alcohol people left. And um, that actually helped them greatly because they were just so happy that they had a group where they had, you know, just them in that group and they didn't have to listen to those other people who had a totally different problem in their mind, right? And um, so we found that to be extremely helpful in terms of, of, um, of helping manage the ACA rate and keeping people in treatment. So again, um, although I did present some statistics and things, the idea is really just to show you it's, it's not absolute rocket science. You can take this intake data that you do, you know, do a thorough intake assessment, um, do some basic review, look for some basic trends, and, um, and begin sort of playing with the idea of a, a risk at intake checklist for your organization or your practice. And, um, and so I hope that was helpful. And thank you so much for participating today. Great. Thank you so much, Siobhan. This was a great presentation. Um, before we get to our summary questions and to the audience Q&A portion of today's event, I'd like to hand things over to Melanie Melcher from Foundations for a few words from our sponsor. Thanks so much, Julie. Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help, to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration, and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to get involved, give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the $10 discount code WEBINAR2015 to register for any future 6K event. Back to you, Julie. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, we've already had a number of questions from the audience that have come in. However, we'd like to remind you that you can use the Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to submit a question at any time.
So Siobhan, let's start with a quick summary question uh, before we get into the audience questions. Can you summarize the key characteristics of those most likely to stay in treatment? What would that person or personality actually look like? So it sounds like from at least one of the things that you said that this might be someone who's female, for example. Can you give us an idea of what that person might look like? So actually, what I, I'll, I'll take you back to that sample risk at intake checklist and, um, and, and kind of go the other way on that because that's the beauty of this data. The, the regression is that we can say it's the opposite of this. So for example, um, and males, as long as they, they scored low on employment, like they feel very secure in their, their finances and their employment life, they're a good risk. They're, they're, they're going to be high on the scale of, of remaining in treatment. Um, so it's not quite as simple as just male, female. So a female who, for example, comes in and she scores low on alcohol or is not a cocaine use disorder person. Um, and we also saw females who have mood disorder or high levels of, of depression. Um, those are very likely to stay in treatment. Um, people who acknowledge uh, that they are troubled or bothered by either their drug use or their alcohol use, or I, I would actually even go people who acknowledge that they're troubled or bothered by, um, as well as their psych use, I mean, their psych issues. Um, again, also people who feel like treatment is important, you know, that's one of the A's, like how important is treatment for you at this time. People who report treatment, the higher on the scale that they report that they believe treatment is, you know, would indicate that they're very motivated for treatment. Um, anyone who is, appears to be in, a, in a, a high level contemplation or an action phase um, when it comes to readiness to change um, is more likely. And um, I, I would say people who, based on the intoxication and, and the use, the fewer uh, substances that they have used in the 30 days prior to treatment, perhaps the more, this is a little iffy, but perhaps the more likely they are to remain in treatment as well, suggesting that maybe they've tapered down themselves or been trying to, to help do something for themselves even before they began. Okay, great. Um, and also, you, um, you didn't mention too much about families. Should treatment programs enlist families to help uh, combat the risk of leaving treatment early? Absolutely. One of the other things um, that we did um, that came up, thank you so much for asking that, that came up as a result of looking at um, the initial study where we saw that, that um, uh, the families did, you know, the, the family and relationship issues mattered especially for women, was that um, what we do is in certain cases, for example, um, so in some cases, it's not inappropriate um, when the family, especially if the family has been involved in the entire pre-admission process, to sort of let them know ahead of time, look, um, for example, in, in opiate use. You know, opiate use, people come in and the detox um, seems like it's over after four days or so, but there are times when um, actually around two weeks or so they appear to go through sort of a secondary detox. Um, there's, there's nothing called that in the literature. However, what we observe is they have a, a, a sudden increase in anxiety and perhaps some additional physical symptoms that appear about that time point. Um, letting the family know that that's going to happen. Um, preparing the family for some of the, the things that patients might say. Um, at foundations, we have very extensive family weekends, but even in terms of just having a conversation with the family ahead of time and saying, look, you know, um, given the nature of the disorder that they're coming in with, you might be, you know, start hearing things around two weeks that say, I feel better, I'm fine, or, or I'm still sick and I need to leave. You know, there's, there's a conversation they might try to have with you. Please, you know, try and circle that back to us and allow us to help you have that conversation with your loved one in treatment. Um, so, yeah, family involvement, family um, buy-in to treatment is so very important. Thank you for asking. Great. And we do have some really good questions from the audience. Let's see how many of these we can get through in our time. Um, based on studies, the longer people are in treatment, the more successful they typically are. But is there a time and a place where too much treatment might be hurting the client? For example, if someone has had 20, 30, maybe 50 attempts um, at treatment, is there a point in time where it's diminishing returns? Well, so I, I get the, the comment about diminishing returns. And um, so, you know, what's really interesting is that um, – 
addiction is one of the it's probably the only place that we expect people to you know come in in a, in, in a long term chronic disorder get treated and and, and be sort of done. Um, what people don't realize is that, for example, when it comes to diabetes, um, within the first 90 days after recognizing and beginning a diabetic treatment regimen, 67% of people end up in the emergency room with a diabetic episode. So I don't know about 20 or 30. That's, that's a lot. But I will tell you um, that so often the first several episodes of treatment might really be to move them into, you know, get them actually into a pre-contemplative or begin a contemplative stage where they're actually even willing to say, okay, yes, there is a problem. Um, and, and, and so because of the, the long-term nature of this disorder, you know, um, they say relapse is um, a reality, but it's not a requirement. But it, what that indicates is that, that it does happen. Um, so I guess there's two parts to that question. In the chronic relapser, you, you have to begin to look, you know, am I doing the same thing in terms of treatment? Am I continuing to try to provide the same treatment and expect a different result? You know, and what can be done differently? Is there something that we're missing? You know, and then in terms of, um, of some of the other, you know, um, issues, is it a mental health issue? Is it a trauma issue? Is there something underlying it that we're not hitting? So. I, I'm really hesitant to say that, yes, there, there could be diminishing returns when, you know, in some cases it takes, I've seen it take 15 um, tries for someone to really just, it, for it to finally dawn on them that they need help and that they, they can get help. You know, if you look at that risk checklist again, where are they when they come in on that scale of, you know, being troubled or bothered by their issue and how important they feel treatment is at the time? Someone who comes in very unmotivated might take many more attempts, um, and I would hate to discourage ever trying. Great. We've had quite a few folks in the audience also ask about mandated treatment, for example, from drug courts. Does that create a different scenario? What are your observations on that? So, um, you know, the contingency management model is completely different from a voluntary model. Um, however, what I would say is it would be really helpful in terms of assessing client readiness to ask them some of those, those questions, either, you know, using their Eureka, that 32-item scale, to see where they are in their readiness for change um, and or to see, you know, just how even some of those subscale questions from the ASI, like, you know, again, how troubled or bothered are you um, and how important is treatment. Um, and trying to get honest answers, I know, is, is very difficult. Um, contingency management um, issues, cases such as that where something really big is at stake, like losing my job or losing my freedom, um, that's a they, – they, they make it a little bit more difficult to get honest. Um, answers. Um, however, again, they've been extremely effective for, for many people, and there's, a, there's a, a group, the DuPont group out there, who's been researching the use of that contingency management model, um, you know, in, 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 in non-court type mandated cases, and the efficacy of using that type of a model, you know, by putting something at stake with, with fairly good results. So um, I would you know, anyone interested in that, I'd look to that literature. Um, again, it's called the DuPont Group and their white paper. Great. We have time for one more quick one. Um, I know you talked about honesty. Um, so someone in our audience is asking, if you're familiar with the client before intake and know that he or she is not being truthful when you're asking these questions, um, should you adjust the score? Should you make a note? Uh, how should you handle it when you know someone's not being truthful? Right. So, yeah, that's pretty. That's a great question because the in original ASI, the full version, does come with a rating section. So that, and most you know, large psychometric instruments come with a section where the person administering it can can sort of give a score or a scale as how honest I believe these answers are or how truthful they are. So yes, if um, if you know you're doing it on the third day and you've had the opportunity to interact with them for two days and they're saying oh yeah it's really important this matters to me so much yet every action that they have taken in those first 48 hours shows that it doesn't i would definitely take that into account if i was developing a checklist and um and and 
you know, there's nothing that says that your checklist has to only be based on, on client answers, you know, patient answers. There's no reason to actually, you know, um, not bring this forth with the staff and, and ask, for example, your maybe your residential counselors or the people who interact directly with them, you know, so what do you see? And build them into that risk score. Great. Well, thank you for that. That is all the time that we have for questions today, but we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Again, should you have any trouble with the process, we ask that you do not reach out to today's sponsor as they will not be able to assist you. Instead, reach out to the help desk. CE Learning Systems has approved today's program for one continuing education credit. To receive your certificate of completion, please click the green CE Certificate button, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and Program Evaluation located in the Resources area and follow the instructions provided. For those watching from a mobile device or tablet, you will need to email the Help Desk to receive a Program Evaluation and Certificate for this program. Please note that CE Credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for today's live event. If you have any questions, please click the purple Contact Webinar Help Desk button at the bottom of the screen. And also, please join us on Thursday, February 26, 2015 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time for another Addiction Professional Webinar sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network along with Millennium Health. That program is titled Women in Recovery, Breaking Free from Addiction, and it is presented by Jessica Schmoll. A link will appear on your screen for you to register for the program. You can also register for the event by clicking register for the next AP webinar sponsored by Foundations at the bottom right of the screen. And I want to thank Siobhan Morse once again for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank Millennium Health for making today's Foundation Recovery Network program possible. Finally, thank you to everyone in our audience for participating today. We do hope that you'll join us again in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar. Thank you so much. This concludes today's presentation.